Hello everyone. In the last lecture, we started discussing about the properties of the aggregates and uh, we could discuss only about the uh, impact value test which is used to quantify the toughness characteristic of the uh, mineral aggregates. So, let us uh, start discussing about uh, other tests uh, today. Uh, which are uh, further used to quantify different uh, other characteristics of the mineral aggregates that we use in pavement construction. Today we will start with the Los Angeles abrasion uh, value test which is used to know about the resistance of the aggregates to abrasive forces. So, this test is an indirect measure of abrasive strength of aggregates used in construction of roads. So, this abrasion can happen in different forms. Uh, Typically, it is assumed that this abrasion could be because of the movement of the vehicles, because of the frictional forces which act between the tyre and the pavement surface that can cause abrasion of the aggregates, especially on the surface of the pavement. Well, the abrasion forces can also be induced during the production in the plant when the aggregates are stockpiled, when the aggregates are dumped or when the mixture finally is taken to the field and compacted under the rollers. These abrasive forces can cause different, um, different actions uh, on the aggregate uh, particles and these different durations where the abrasion or these different locations where the abrasion uh, forces act, they do not necessarily uh, you know have the same effect on the properties of the aggregates. Again, like the uh, impact value test, the Los Angeles abrasion test is an empirical test and previous studies have not found uh, you know good correlation with the performance of the pavement. Some studies have shown that rather than quantifying the, uh, the abrasion resistance of the aggregate, this test gives some indication about the amount of dust which can get generated with the particular source of the aggregate. So, this happens specifically during the production when the aggregates are stockpiled. So, during the stockpiling since the aggregates uh, you know has to travel considerable distance, the aggregate particles collide with each other and in during this process uh, sufficient amount of dust can be generated by the breakdown of particles and this dust finally, if it remains on the surface of the aggregates, uh, it can cause poor adhesion between the bitumen and the aggregate surface in a hot mix asphalt which can cause moisture damage related issue. So, you see our discussion uh, you know has uh, shifted from uh, the abrasion resistance to moisture resistance. So, you know this is what our researchers have indicated about this test. We will discuss one more test in the next slide which is the micro devil test and researchers have indicated that uh, micro devil test in fact is uh, one of the uh, test which gives good indication about the abrasion resistance and we will see how these two tests are different from each other and we will also see the difference in the experimental setup for these two uh, tests. If you look at the process which we will be discussing shortly in the next slide, we have a drum which rotates about the um, horizontal axis and then inside this drum we put some specific type of uh, aggregate particles. In this test is done on coarse aggregate not on fine aggregates. So, we have different uh, gradations of coarse aggregates de depending on the type of mix which will put inside this drum uh, along with some abrasive charges which you can see here. And these abrasive charges are put to uh, induce uh, artificial abrasion between the aggregate particles in the drum. And this drum rotates about horizontal axis uh, for a specific number of rotations that we will again discuss in the next slide when we discuss about the steps. So, these are some pictures of the Los Angeles abrasion machine taken from uh, the laboratory at IIT Roorkee. So, you can see that we have this cylinder which is placed inside the machine and this cylinder rotates about its horizontal axis. This has an opening here where the materials and abrasive charges are put. This is one picture showing the different charges. I have two charges with me just to um, have a visual idea of how these charges looks like. So, you can see that these are spherical balls which are used as charges in the Los Angeles abrasion machine. 
12 charges should uh, typically be available and the number of charges that we use it depends on the type of gradation um, for uh, while doing the test. You can see again the top of the uh, cylinder this is the opening from where we will put the material. So, after we open the uh, cap the material is put inside the aggregates and charges and, and then the test is actually done. So, uh, talking about the steps of the Los Angeles abrasion uh, test, uh, first we have to take oven dried aggregates. Now, the uh, type of aggregates which we have to choose, the size of aggregate which we have to take, it depends on the type of gradation. Um, I will show you it in a table. Uh, so, what we will do after we choose the appropriate material, we will put this material uh, inside the machine with the respective abrasive charges. Now, again the choice of the number of abrasive charges, it is a function of aggregate gradation. Then we will start the test, uh, this cylinder it rotates at an approximate speed of 20 to 33 revolutions per minute and then the number of revolutions depends on the gradation. So, you can see that here we have options from A to G, alright. So, let us uh, before I discuss these steps just have a look at this particular table. You can see that uh, we have materials up to 2.36 mm. So, these can be considered as coarse type of aggregates um, and the choice of A, B, C and D depends on the layer we are trying to examine. For example, if it is a uh, WBM uh, layer, then usually we select the gradation E here. If we are looking for dense graded mixtures like bituminous mixtures, we choose uh, B, C or D here. So, then again uh, after uh, having the appropriate choice, the amount of material to be selected will change. For example, if you see the gradation B, here we will take uh, 5 kg uh, total material. So, 2500 grams will be aggregates ranging from 20 to 12.5 mm, whereas 2500 grams will be materials ranging from um, 12.5 to 10 mm. Similarly, uh, for C 5 kg material uh, from 10 mm to 6.3 2.5 kg and 6.3 to 4.75 2.5 kg. For coarser uh, gradations like uh, as I said for WBM let us say, so you have to use um, 2500 gram material ranging from 80 to 63 mm from 63 to 50 again 2.5 kg and then 5 kgs from 50 to 40. So, likewise you know uh, depending on the uh, type of gradation you have to choose appropriate amount of material. And then uh, all the other parameters as I said that the number of revolutions for example, number of revolution is a function of the gradation for A, B, C and D we will use 500 revolutions for E, F, G 1000 revolutions alright. So, after uh, the number of revolutions are completed, uh, then you can imagine that these abrasive charges which are placed inside the machine, they will have a tendency to break down the aggregates because again the aggregate is also traveling uh, inside, it is uh, colliding each other and also um, colliding the uh, abrasive uh, charges. Uh, and in this process, the particles will break down into smaller sizes. So, after completing uh, this number of revolution, we will take out the entire material and it we will sieve it through 1.7 mm IS sieve. So, here we expect that if the aggregates have high abrasion resistance, then less amount of breakdown will take place. So, lower quantity of material should pass through 1.7 mm. And uh, the amount of material passing through 1.7 mm is actually used to quantify the abrasion resistance, alright. So, material coarser than 1.7 mm are washed, dried and weight, alright. So, the ratio of material passing to the total weight is reported as the Los Angeles abrasion value in percentage, okay. So, uh, again uh, just like impact value for different types of uh, mixes which are placed in different layers of the pavement, there are different specifications. For example, for WBM and WMM which are placed uh, as base layer typically, the maximum permitted value is 40 percent. For DBM and BC it is 35 percent and 30 percent respectively. But here also I just like to reiterate which I just mentioned in the last slide that 
not necessarily that an aggregate having higher Los Angeles aberration value will have poor uh, performance. In fact, many a times it has been found that even aggregates having, sh having higher aberration value uh, or Los Angeles aberration value have shown um, good performance uh, in the actual field. Well, uh, this shows the uh, choice of number of aggregate charges and the corresponding weight. So, actually the dia of this ball uh, which we take in Los Angeles aberration test is approximately 48 mm. So, this is the dia and the weight somewhere lies between 390 to 445 uh, grams. So, that is the individual weight. So, as I mentioned ideally you know 12 weight should be present that is the maximum number of weights that will be required corresponding to different gradation. However, for example, for gradation D only 6 balls are required for gradation C we, we have a requirement of uh, 8 number of balls and for gradation B uh, 11 number of balls should be uh, taken. All right. Uh, so, I hope again uh, this is clear to you that how uh, this test is done. Uh, as I mentioned in lieu of Los Angeles aberration test, another aberration test which is called as micro devil uh, test can also be used. Previous studies have shown that this test gives better representation of aberration resistance in contrast to Los Angeles aberration test which uh, you know gives indication related to the generation of fines. If you compare the uh, effect of micro devil and Los Angeles abrasion, uh, micro devil, devil abrasion it tends to polish the aggregates while Los Angeles abrasion tends to break them. So, this is the primary difference um, uh, in the effect of uh, these tests on the aggregate uh, particles. So, how is micro devil test different from Los Angeles test? Uh, this is also a similar type of abrasion test. But here we use 1500 gram of aggregates which is actually immersed in 2 liters of water for at least 1 hour. So, here uh, this means that this test is carried out under water alright. So, we have to take a uh, sufficient amount of water 2 liters and then place 1500 gram of aggregates keep it immersed in water and then place the entire uh, thing inside the abrasion machine. Uh, then here also we use steel charges, uh, the total weight is 5000 gram which is placed along with the water and the aggregate uh, materials. Then we allow the machine to run, so here also the machine rotates about the horizontal axis. Uh, so, the machine run at 100 rpm and uh, the number of revolutions it ranges depending on the size of the aggregates. So, similar to Los Angeles aberration here also we have choice for different sizes of aggregates. So, the number of revolutions ranges from 9000 to 12000 and the time uh, again depending on the size of the aggregate ranges from 95 to 120 minutes. After completion of the test or after completion of this abrasion process, we will take out the material and we will pass the material through 1.18 mm sieve. So, material passing 1.18 mm sieve is used to calculate the abrasion resistance here all right so i hope again uh, this test is also clear and its difference with los angeles abrasion test uh, now we will uh, discuss about the uh, durability and soundness aspects of aggregate particles in the durability and soundness test what we are trying to do we are trying to assess the resistance of the aggregates to the action of wetting or drying cycles and or or freezing and thawing cycles. So, specifically in cold weather regions what happens that because of this capillary rise of the water, the water can get freezed inside the pores of the aggregates uh, or, or not only capillary rise the general movement of water uh, and the formation of ice this water can get freezed within the pores of the aggregates and then when the temperature rises this uh, uh, this ice melts and it comes out of the pores and during when the cycle continues during this process uh, the phenomena can degrade uh, some amount of material depending on the type of the aggregate. Some material can come out and the aggregates will have a tendency to lose their weight over a period of time which is not desirable and therefore, this is what we are trying to measure here uh, in the laboratory. 
So, he, I mean we will of course uh, comment on the suitability of this test method, but before that let us see the process. So, here oven dried aggregates retained on 4.75 mm sieve indicating that these are coarse aggregates. Uh, they are used and separated into individual sizes ranging from 80 mm to 4.75 mm. So, again this test is done on different sizes of aggregates and then we uh, do the weighted average to calculate the uh, durability uh, or to quantify the uh, quantify the resistance or the uh, you know durability of the aggregates. So, here uh, these aggregates these individual aggregates they are immersed in saturated solution of either sodium sulphate or magnesium sulphate. So, either of the two can be used to do the test um, for 16 to 18 hours typically all right. Then what we will do? We will immerse it, then we will take it out, drain it for 15 minutes approximately so that the entire water get washed away and then we will dry these materials in the oven and again cool it at room temperature. So, this is one cycle. So, what we are doing here? We are immersing the aggregates in the sodium sulphate or magnesium sulphate solution, keeping it there for 16 to 18 hours and during this process what happens? Uh, the sodium and this magnesium sulphate solution it reacts with the aggregates and they form um, uh, salts all right salt crystals are formed and let us say if this is an aggregate. So, in this pores this salt crystals will be formed and it will get deposited in this pores and I mean this is the purpose of doing test that you know this is a uh, indication of formation of ice or this is we are trying to replicate the process of formation of ice here by the formation of actual salt crystals. So, uh, this completes one cycle that uh, your salt crystals are formed then we take out the material from the solution drain it off. So, that entire material get washed away and uh, I mean the, the water the solution gets washed away then we will take this aggregate we will dry it in the oven until constant weight is reached and then we will cool it at room temperature. And then again this material what we will do we will again put it in the sodium and ma or magnesium sulphate solution do the entire process again. So, we will do it for typically 5 cycles all right and uh, after 5 cycles we will calculate how much weight is lost because what we are expecting when we are taking out the material from the solution draining it all right draining it. So, while draining it this uh, crystals which are formed they will get washed away and during this process uh, some if, if the aggregate particles have a tendency to break down under this action some of this some of the aggregate particles also will get er eroded uh, along with the solution all right. So, there will be a loss in weight. So, after the end of 5 cycles we want to see how much total uh, loss in weight has taken place all right and the specification says that the loss in weight should not be more than 12 percent if it is a sodium sulphate solution and 18 percent if it is a magnesium sulphate solution. The reason for two different numbers are that magnesium sulphate solution has harsher effect on the uh, aggregate particles in comparison to sodium sulphate that is why the limit is on the higher side. Again a lot of debate has been done in the literature regarding the suitability of the test method. Uh, this test has been criticized by various researches and researchers have found very poor correlation with the values of the uh, soundness test and the actual performance. In fact, uh, literature also mentions that the coefficient of variation which means the repeatability of this test in the laboratory is very poor. Uh, 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 there are studies that have shown that the coefficient of variation can be as high as 40 percent. It has been found that even though aggregates uh, show higher loss in this test, they give uh, relatively good performance uh, in the field. Uh, so, again uh, the suitability of this test method is also questionable. Um, researchers have also uh, debated and argued that specifically for hot mix asphalt or, or aggregates used in bituminous mixtures this test is not very suitable. The reason being uh, in the bituminous mixture the aggregates are already coated with bitumen therefore, the chances of formation of you know uh, exposure of these materials to 
uh, water and then formation of ice crystal is uh, very less or negligible and that is why um, conducting uh, this test on, on HMA aggregates is questionable. Uh, however, this test uh, is generally used only as a pass fail criteria to select the aggregates and uh, in India also the specification mentions that this test should be done only on those aggregates whose water absorption is more than 2 percent. Another aspect of this test is for that you know for specially for carbonate aggregates this sodium and magnesium sulphate can react with this uh, with the surface of this uh, aggregates and uh, therefore can sometimes give uh, erroneous results uh, too. Now, we will discuss about another set of tests you can say uh, which will help us to understand about the amount and quality of uh, fine mat particles in the uh, aggregate gradation, especially the clay particles because we want to avoid um, excess amount of clay material in the aggregate structure. Uh, especially sometimes organic clays or clays of um, having certain minerals such as uh, Montmorillonite, they are not very desirable because they are plastic in nature and in presence of water they can show large variation in the volume which may not be desirable for the structure. That is why it is of interest to know that uh, what amount of fine material which are typically passing 75 micron sieve are present in the aggregate structure and also what is the quality of these fine materials because not necessarily excess of amount of fine materials will be harmful until and unless these have some undesirable uh, properties. So, the first test uh, is the uh, sand equivalent test. So, sand equivalent test is used to quantify the amount of clay or fine dust in fine aggregates. So, this test is done on fine aggregates. So, here what we do? We take materials passing 4.75 mm sieve. The material passing 4.75 mm sieve is immersed in a flocculating solution. So, we prepare a special solution of uh, a mixture of calcium cl uh, chloride and glycerin. Uh, once we prepare this uh, solution, then uh, we put the material inside this solution and we agitate it we shake it properly. It is shaken either mechanically or manually and then we allow it to sit for 20 minutes. So, what happens when we allow it to sit for 20 minutes uh, because of the uh, difference in density uh, and size the clay particles get separated from the rest of the fine materials and uh, inside the solution it will look something like this. So, the coarser material will go and settle at the bottom and the fine material will be at the top. All right, and you can see a clear difference that this is the amount of clay and then this is the amount of sand particle. All right, And then we calculate the sand equivalent value as the ratio of height of sand to the total height of the um, material in the uh, measuring tube. Because we want less amount of clay or less amount of fine particles which means higher the sand equivalent value better it is because here we are trying to take the ratio of sand versus total. All right. So, sand higher is the sand better it is it indirectly represents that the amount of clay or the fine material is less. Usually most of the specification says that a minimum value of 40 to 50 is desired um, especially when we are uh, using the aggregates for the production of hot mix asphalt. Uh, this is also considered as a quick field test and in fact, this test has been found to be uh, good uh, in terms of its correlation with the stripping resistance of the aggregates. Uh, why stripping resistance? Because you see if you have an aggregate particle and if you have very fine uh, materials, uh, so these materials can lie on the surface of the aggregate and when the aggregate gets coated with bitumen, this uh, particles which, which are at the surface of the aggregate, they disrupt the adhesion or the bond between the uh, bitumen and the aggregate particle. And uh, therefore, this film can get broken uh, especially in presence of water. So, lower are the amount of fines, better will be the resistance to moisture. I hope this test is clear to you. Well, we have uh, other simple tests that are generally used in the study of soils to quantify the properties of the fine uh, materials such as clay. A set of these tests 
are related to the Atterberg limits where we are trying to find out the liquid limit, plastic limit and plasticity index which gives us indication about the plastic properties of the fine materials. Now, since this is done as specially on very fine materials, so we take only materials passing through 425 micron sieve. So, using the liquid limit and plastic limit here what we are doing, we are calculating the plasticity index which is the difference between liquid limit and plastic limit. We will discuss about what is liquid limit and what is plastic limit uh, and it helps us to quantify the amount and type of clay in the fine aggregates. However, this particular uh, test values like plasticity index or uh, plastic limit and liquid limit, they have no reported correlation with field performance. Here as I mentioned, we are trying to measure the consistency of the fine material where consistency is defined as the degree of firmness. So, we can say either the material is very soft, it is soft, it is stiff, it is very stiff or it is hard in nature. All right. uh, and uh, here in this test, we are using the Atterberg limits. So, now let us see the definition of each of these terms. So, what is liquid limit? Liquid limit uh, gives us an indication uh, about the transition of soil from the liquid state to the plastic state. So, first we have to understand that any soil in presence of moisture, they undergoes a transition from one stage to another because water has a predominant effect on fine materials, especially related to uh, its flow and also related to its compaction characteristics. And some materials in presence of water can show very huge change in their volume and this change is ideally not desired during the construction purpose. So, we are interested to see that how different fine materials behave in presence of water. And we want to avoid those fine materials which are excessively plastic or excessively show changes in volume. Um, so, what is liquid limit? Liquid limit again is that particular point you can say or moisture content where there is a transition of soil from liquid state to plastic state. So, which means the soil when we are giving any strain to the soil, the soil just starts to take the load. Beyond the liquid limit, it does not take any load. You give a strain, there is no stress, but at the liquid limit, it just starts to take up some load. All right. So, in this way you can understand. Then what is plastic limit? Again plastic limit is that particular moisture content you can say or that particular zone where the soil will behave as a semi solid material rather than a liquid material. At this moisture content if you try to take a soil sample, make a thread with the soil sample of approximately 3 mm in dia, this thread will crack or it will crumble. So, that point indicates the plastic limit of the soil. Plasticity index on the other hand is just the uh, difference between liquid limit and plastic limit and plasticity index actually is an important parameter which tells us about the plastic behavior of the soil depending on the magnitude. Usually for top layers in the pavement construction, a value higher than 4 is not recommended. Um, the plasticity index should not be more than 4. This picture shows the change in the behavior of the soil with change in moisture content. You see that li beyond liquid limit, uh, there is no stress when you apply a strain. Between a liquid limit and plastic limit, the soil takes up some stress because it just starts to take the load. When it moves to the semi-solid state, it, it can take more stress here. So, you know these are the regions where the soil behave as solid, semi-solid, plastic and liquid. And this explains the change in volume of the soil with the change in volume of water. So, you can see that there is another limit called a shrinkage limit which we are not discussing. So, shrinkage limit is that limit below which the change in amount of moisture does not change the uh, volume of the soil because these uh, water are occupied within the pores of of the soil particles. So, if you take a uh, unit volume, you have soil particles and let us say there are pores available. All right. So, this is a constant volume. If you keep on increasing the water here, first the water will go and settle in the pores, which means the volume is not changing. But once the soil gets saturated, the increase in moisture will increase the volume of the soil and be 
this is the shrinkage limit beyond which the volume starts changing. So, you see up to shrinkage limit there is no change in volume of the soil, then after shrinkage limit up to plastic limit there is a change and again there is a change alright. So, this is just to show you how the volume changes with the change in volume of water. Well, this is the uh, Casagrande apparatus which is used to uh, assess the liquid limit of the fine materials passing 425 micron sieve. So, what you do here? So, this is the apparatus. This apparatus has an uh, inclined brass cup, inclined brass cup which is placed on a rubber base. I will take a different color to explain. So, this is a rubber uh, base and this is an inclined brass cup. So, this brass cup can be rotated using this handle like this in this direction. So, when this is rotated this brass cup will rise and there will be a you know it will rise to a gap of 1 centimeter approximately. What we do here first we will take soil mix it with a particular amount of moisture let us say that moisture content is M C 1 alright and then uh, we will place the soil uh, like this here. Then we will take the Casa Grande groove grooving tool. So, using this grooving tool we will make this groove. If you see the cross section this groove will appear something like this alright something like this. So, this groove uh, is basically 8 mm in height approximately uh, the, the bottom is 2 mm and the top is 11 mm approximately. So, this is a typical uh, dimension for after we make the groove alright and then uh, after we make the groove we will use this handle we will rotate this handle after rotation what will happen this soil will try to come close to each other. So, we will see uh, until this closes by a length of 12 mm will stop there. So, we will start giving the number of blows and we will visually observe how the soil is moving and once we find that the soil has come closer enough such that the length of closure is approximately 12 mm we will stop and we will note down the number of blows. Let us say for M C 1 it is N 1. Then what we will do? We will change the moisture content. Let us say we take another moisture content um, M C 2 and then we again uh, check the number of blows at which there is a 12 mm closure. Then we will change the moisture content again we will check. So, finally what we will do? We will plot the variation of number of blows and moisture content alright and this is in log scale. And the number of blows required at higher moisture content will be less. So, you will get a graph something like this and you see that what is the moisture content corresponding to 25 number of blows alright. What is that moisture content? So, this moisture content is the liquid limit of the sample alright. So, this is how you determine the liquid limit. Uh, well, the experiment of plastic limit is um, uh, very uh, easy. What you do here? You will take a soil sample mix it with some quantity of water and then you will try to roll it on a glass pad. And uh, then uh, you keep on changing the moisture content keep on making a thread and our aim here is to make a 3 mm thread <coughs> ok. And we will visually see that what is that moisture content at which the 3 mm thread will crumble visually. If you have this sample the crumb will be occur something like this. You will stop when you see that crumbling occurs and for that soil sample you will find out the moisture content by taking the uh, weight after oven drying and weight before alright. So, that will give you the moisture content and that moisture content is the plastic limit and plasticity index is just the difference between the liquid limit and plastic limit and this plasticity index along with the liquid limit of the soil can be placed in this uh, chart which is a standard A line chart. Uh, or plasticity index chart and we will see that where our soil sample actually lies. Uh, I am not going to discuss in this lecture in detail about uh, this chart, but just to give you an idea that this chart has different locations to identify different types of soils. For example, here C indicates clay soil, M indicates silty soil alright. So, uh, O indicates organic soil and then the other uh, alphabet like L it indicates low compressibility, I indicates intermediate compressibility whereas H indicates high compressibility. So, we want to avoid soil which are actually uh, on, on, on the ri extreme right side because these are 
highly organic soil and since having high compressibility they will show larger changes in volume uh, with change in moisture content. Depending on the specification we have to choose uh, the appropriate uh, soil which lies in the specified range. Well, uh, this again uh, is taken from the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways for different types of layer. If you see for bituminous layer, the code says that the plasticity index of fine material uh, passing 425 micron sieve should be less than 4. For granular base, they have limits on liquid limit which should be less than 20 and plasticity index which should be less than 6. For granular sub base, it is 25 and 6 whereas for embankment and subgrade, it is 50 and 25. As you move down the pavement, the requirement you know gets more relaxed, you can use inferior type of material also. Now we will discuss about the next test which is not typically used in India but is a French specification basically. So this is a French test and in fact a very interesting and good test to quantify the quality of clay fines. So this will not tell us about specifically about the amount of clay fines, but it will say that uh, that though you have particles of smaller sizes in your mix, so let us see what is the quality. Is it really of poor quality or the quality is acceptable in nature? So, this quantifies the quality of clay fines. It will tell us whether the clay fines are organic, expansive, having iron hydroxide characteristics, etc. Here what we do, we take 10 gram of soil sample passing 75 micron sieve. So, this test is carried out on filler particles basically uh, and this 10 gram sample is dispersed in 30 gram of distilled water in a beaker. So, you take a beaker having distilled water and uh, 30 gram distilled water and then you place 10 gram of soil sample passing 75 micron sieve. Then we will make another solution where 1 gram methylene blue is uh, dissolved in enough distilled water to produce 200 ml solution. Uh, so, you can say that you will have 0 0.5 percent uh, methylene blue here uh, in the solution 0 0.5 percent. Then what we do from this solution of methylene blue which we have prepared, we will titrate the methylene blue using a uh, burette uh, and we will do it step wise alright. Uh, in 0 0.5 ml uh, aliquots and we will take 0 0.5 ml from this, put it in this beaker and then we will continuously stirring this beaker. And after addition of this 0 0.5 ml uh, aliquot, um, you know this is done step wise. So, after doing each step, what you will do? You will take a drop of uh, you know uh, this aggregate suspension using a glass rod, we will dip the glass rod here and after dipping the glass rod, we will just put a mark, we will just put this glass rod over this uh, filter paper. Similarly, again then we will uh, take another 0 0.5 ml, put it inside, continuously stir it, again take a drop, put the mark here. Again take 0 0.5 ml, put the glass rod, again put a mark here. So, we will keep on doing that and we will observe this mark, this is what we are going to do. And when should we stop? Because we are continuously adding 0 0.5 ml methylene blue solution inside this uh, beaker having 10 gram uh, filler and 30 gram distilled water. Okay. So, when are we going to stop? So, we will stop when we see that the outer ring of this drop um, turns light blue. So, initially when you will put the drop, what you will see? You will see a dark brown strain, dark strain here and a clear water strain on the outer side. As we keep on increasing the methylene blue solution, so what is happening here? Let us try to understand the fundamental. The methylene, if this is the soil particle, the methylene blue is trying to, uh, you know, cover this uh, soil particle. So, when sufficient methylene blue is there, when it covers the entire surface area of this clay particle, then what will happen? You will see that there is a dark spot and instead of clear water, this is blue in color. The outer circle comes blue, which means the methylene blue solution has now entirely covered the surface of the soil particle, which means finer is the soil particle, specific surface area is more, therefore more amount of methylene blue will be required. This quantifies the specific surface area characteristics also uh, of the uh, clay particles. 
all right this is what you see i hope it's clear here that this is the initial time when you see clear mark clear outer circle you see slide blue slide blue and now it's very clear here the mark blue is clear here so you will stop when you see a clear blue mark over the light blue mark on the outer circle so that is when you will stop so this is finally reported an milligram of methylene blue per gram of fine aggregate fraction all right so uh, as i mentioned the amount of methylene blue which will be required is proportional to the product of clay content and specific surface area of the clay and therefore a low value is desired low value will indicate that the surface area is more which means it's not extremely fine all right so a low value of 5 to 6 is most desirable and if the value is more than 20 the sample can be considered as failed and should not be used for uh, construction purposes and research uh, has indicated that methylene blue value is is just like the sand equivalent value is a very good indicator of moisture susceptibility so with this we will stop here today and we will continue discussing about the aggregate properties our next presentation will be focused on discussing mainly about the specific gravity of the aggregates which is a very important property specially related to the mixed design of bituminous mixture so we'll try to understand the concept of specific gravity more fundamentally and uh, we will also uh, finally discuss about some of the um, you know um, stress strain behavior of the typical uh, aggregate particles and uh, then the tests that are used uh, as input in the pavement design when layers of these aggregate particles are used then we will meet in the next presentation thank you